Yep. Good evening. Um, very good to see such a good turnout for this evening's presentation. So just a few brief words of introduction from me before I hand you over to Tony. Um, firstly, just to emphasize the point Norman made, uh, please keep your microphones muted um, to avoid any uh, disruption by background noise. Um, the talk this evening is from Tony, Tony Leach from the Norfolk Fungus Study Group, who's going to be talking about dung fungi or coprophyllus fungi, um, which is a, a subject of, of great interest uh, to many people. And Tony himself will be well known to, to many of us who are involved in field mycology in the UK. Um, so I will hand over to Tony in a second, but just to also remind people, if you have any questions, um, be helpful if you can put them in the chat during the course of the talk. And then once Tony's finished his presentation, we'll pick up on those questions at the end and um, hand them over to Tony to, to answer. So without further ado, Tony, over to you. Tell us more about dung fungi. I will try to do just that. Well, thank you, Marcus, and uh, welcome to everybody, and thank everybody for attending. Um, so, dung fungi or coprophyllus fungi, strictly, these are, are growing on animal dung, uh, but I'm going to widen it a little bit um, to include fungi that are associated with um, animal dung uh, as well. Uh, let's just make it clear, we're talking herbivore dung here. Um, R.W.G. Dennis, the Q mycologist, once uh, wrote that uh, fame um, would come to the first mycologist to study uh, fungi on carnivore dung. I'm not that person. Um, but first, if I may, can I put myself in context just briefly? Um, my first uh, field fungus experience was as a schoolboy. Um, I've taken out on a, a field trip by uh, a biology master and I was completely fascinated by these strange structures in the woods there. He, the biology master, could name very few of them, um, but that didn't matter. It was the um, it was the ex excitement of finding them and the uh, the diversity that fascinated. Um, many years later, I became a biology master and um, I still couldn't identify quite a lot of what I found and I still can't. But um, I was very fortunate for most of my working life. I was in a school which had a, about 100 acres of grounds, of which about a third was mixed deciduous wood. Um, so I could spend any time I had uh, looking for fungi. And just 50 yards away from uh, my classroom was a wax cap lawn. So I could go out in a break if I had time, um, pick up a specimen, bring it back, and then perhaps later in the day, use the biology department microscope to have a, a closer look at it. So I joined the British Mycological Society and was enormously uh, supported uh, by uh, many uh, others, experienced uh, mycologists within the society on workshops and forays and through their publications. And um, soon after my, or just before my retirement in 2005, I was involved in um, setting up the Norfolk Fungus Study Group. Um, it tossed on for some years, but then um, with intermittent meetings, but then about 10 years ago, um, new blood um, arrived. And since then, the um, uh, we now have an enthusiastic group of, um, why am I looking at Kaiser's screen? Um, if somebody's sharing the screen, could you take it off, please? Well, I'll go on talking. Oh, thank you, Kaiser. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so um, we, we started the, the Norfolk Fungus Study Group and, and now we've got a, a really enthusiastic group of increasingly competent field mycologists. Um, I have never specialised and I, I find I can get interested only too easily in anything with hyphae. Um, but that means I am certainly not an expert on, on coprophyllus fungi. Um, but I have been helped by those who are, and particularly Mike Richardson, through his workshops and publications. He is the expert. Now, the purpose of this talk is to introduce um, others to um, the fascination of dung fungi. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and uh, 
No, that's. Oh, yes, there we are. Um, yeah, good. Um, so um, why look at dung fungi? Well, these are the reasons that fascinate me, so I'll pass them on. Uh, first of all, the, the diversity. There's a large number of um, dung fungi species in, in Britain, some three or four hundred, probably many more, um, and in various and diverse fungal groups, as we'll see in a few minutes. Um, but if, so it's diverse. It's quite a large group, but it's it's fairly well defined because most of these are obligate um, coprophiles. That is to say, they don't occur on any other substrate. So that kind of defines them as an ecological entity. Um, enough species to engage with, um, but not too many to be totally overwhelming. So, uh, as you will know, the vertebrates um, lack the enzymes needed to catalyze the hydrolysis, the breakdown of plant polysaccharides and, and other plant polymers, um, su such as cellulose. And in order to use these, herbivores employ, as it were, um, microorganisms in their guts, and they often have anatomical um, uh, features to accommodate these microorganisms, which assist in the breakdown of, of the plant polysaccharides into smaller molecules, which can be absorbed and used. Um, but the process is, uh, is never complete. And so their dung contains uh, significant amounts of these organic materials, um, which are still not broken down. But of course, many fungi do have cellulases and other uh, hydrolytic enzymes, so they are able to utilize this, this material. You might think that, um, that dung was an absolutely ideal medium for any saprophytic uh, saprobic fungus, um, but the conditions are, are not entirely good for fungal growth. Uh, they are quite specialised because as well as the partly decomposed plant material, um, there will be um, a great deal of microbial mass, dead bacteria uh, and other microorganisms that have, um, have passed through the animal's gut. And uh, these may well be, or they will be, rich in nitrogenous compounds. And uh, uh, and, and these will, will um, break down again with microbial and fungal action to uh, ammonia, which will increase the pH of the dung, uh, and that probably inhibits a great number of, uh, of fungi. There, there are fungi that are not strictly um, dung fungi, which do occur on fungi uh, on dung, but they're relatively few. So um, there's a great deal to be studied. Convenient. Um, I think this has to be emphasised because, as you'll see later, and, and many of you will know, in order to look at and study dung fungi, you collect the dung and you wait for the fungi to appear. So this is back at base. And that means that you can look at your uh, ledger when you decide that you want a, um, uh, to, uh, a mini foray, you can open your uh, incubated dung and have a look. You don't need to go out. Uh, you can choose when 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 to do this. Um, the uh, um, and you can do it in the comfort of your own workplace. You don't. It's just like a foray. You open up. You don't quite know what's going to be there, and suddenly you see something you haven't seen before. You're surprised, just like um, a, a foray in the field. Um, they're attractive. At least some of them are. Many of them are. They're very pretty. And because they've been um, incubated, grown under, as it were, controlled conditions or protected conditions, they're not um, damaged by weather. Um, they haven't been collected and then bumped around in your collecting bottle or box uh, until you've got home and had time to look at them. They're still there and they're, they're pristine. Um, and I hope to show you some uh, photographs later to make that point. Also, there is accessible literature. I'll talk about that later on in the um, in the presentation. Um, but the literature to get you seriously started is is very easily available, um, which is always good news. And for those of you who enjoy adding um, species to site lists or county lists, um, they're like many, perhaps all microfungi, they're 
very under recorded. Um, I, I, without really trying, I've added about 30 species to the, the Norfolk list. Um, and that's a total of about 4,000 species of fungus. Um, and uh, most of these are, are, are very common and widespread, but they just haven't been looked at by anybody. So un unless you're collecting in an area where Mike Richardson has already worked, um, you'll certainly be able to add species to your local list. Right, so let me introduce um, the, 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 the species we're talking about. Um, few of them, we we'll start with the Basidiomycetes. Um, a few of them are large species of agaric, which are recognizable uh, uh, and, um, in the field, and many will be familiar with these. So the um, large Paniolus, um, the um, egghead mottlegill, um, Another similar but distinctively different um, fungus is the Strepharia semiglobata, and um, a third uh, large agaric, um, easily seen in the, and identified in the field, is um, Coprinopsis nevea, the, the snowy um, ink cap. Um, but the majority of the uh, of, of the true uh, coprophilic um, agarics are in the genus which was formerly Caprinus and has now been split into four um, um, genera and the um, three of which contain Coprophilus uh, species. Um, so uh, Coprinopsis and Coprinellus are the main genera and between them they probably have 30 to 40 British Coprophilus species. So here's, here's one or two of them. Um, and as you can see, um, the, they're, they're often in very good condition. The veil, which is so important in identifying uh, Caprinus coprinoids, um, is, is, is often intact because it hasn't been knocked around. Um, and so most of these are, are sort of two to four centimeters high, some of them a little bit smaller. Um, that the um, the species there, that's Satharella tenuicola. Yeah, no, not a coprinoid, yet, yet, yet it probably is because it was originally uh, described as a coprinopsis. Um, the, um, very, very similar, but um, actually uh, now in Satharella, um, coprinopsis stercorea, good fruiting there. Um, often when they're grown in culture and in, in incubated, um, they, um, because of the lack of light, they will um, grow long and lanky like a, an etiolated plant. Um, but uh, in, in, in good in, um, light environment, then they, um, their natural form is, is typically a couple of centimeters high. Um, to identify, uh, some of them can be identified um, from a general appearance and so get a good clue, but generally you have to do the usual uh, looking at spore size, um, um, uh, cystidia um, also need to be looked at. Um, um, so um, the large num the majority of, um, of, of, of coprophilic agarics are, uh, are these coprinoids, but there are other genera. Um, uh, kind of Cybe, for example, a whole handful of, uh, of, of these can be found on dung, these um, cone heads. Um, Deconica, um, Psilocybe as it was, um, also uh, on dung, mostly dark spored speech species. Um, but there is one that's not very common, we found it once, which is actually a, a Clytocybe, um, Clytocybe amarescens, which grows on old and dry dung. Bit of a surprise, that one. Um, now, some of these uh, small brown uh, agarics are found not on the dung itself, but um, close to the dung or where dung has been. Um, and it, it may be that these species can tolerate um, high levels of nitrogen compounds, particularly ammonia in the soil. Um, and um, it, 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 or they may just be some of them slower growing, 
so that they have started growing when the dung was there. And as the dung has uh, disappeared and been uh, moved by uh, weather or insects, uh, then the mycelium in the soil um, later on has, has fruited. So where the dung has been. Um, Paniolus species will be familiar to many um, of you as the little brown toadstools in um, lawns that have been well fertilized. So they're very tolerant of high nitrogen levels, whereas many grassland species um, are really not. Um, only the slightest whiff of nitrogen fertilizer uh, will um, prevent wax caps and other chegg species from, um, from, from developing. Um, so some of these fungi are probably more accurately described as uh, ammonia fungi or aminophilus uh, fungi. So because they can, they don't actually grow on the dung, but they can tolerate the high levels of ammonia. Um, and these have, um, will have come from the breakdown of um, animal excrete or um, excrement. Um, mainly urea, urea is the main nitrogenous um, excretory product for, from uh, mammals. And this of course will be in the urine um, and then it will break down in the soil, uh, bacterial action to ammonia. But of course, where an animal has done, it will also have urinated. Um, so um, the, these will be found. This, this is a, a, one of the few white spored species that um, associates with, with dung. Um, th this one is often found where um, domestic cats and dogs have used a, a, a latrine area um, and uh, on a couple of occasions that's exactly where I found this but never growing on dung itself. Um, this is a, a, a caprinus, um, a small group of um, coprinoids which I associate with um, not animal, um, sorry not mammal dung uh, but bird dung. Um, and, and this was found um, in a hen house growing on, on wooden uh, piece, uh, piece of wood in the hen house and turned out to be the first uh, British record of, of this rough spored species. Um, now um, let's get on to the, um, the ascomycetes, which are, uh, these are true coprophiles. Very large number of um, uh, apothecial ascomycetes with uh, the cup fungi, discomycetes. Uh, and these are the ones that um, I think are particularly attractive. Um, so as with many other ecological groups, there are a few genera with lots of species and then many genera each with few species. Um, and two of the genera with large number of species are um, Ascobolus and uh, Sacobolus. Um, and these are immediately really distinctive because the ASCII um, protrude from the surface of the hymenium and contain um, dark purple spores. So they're very obvious as these, um, these flecks, these dots um, on the surface of the fungus. Um, um, in Sacobolus, the, um, the spores actually adhere together so they don't separate when they're observed under the microscope. So all eight in the in the ascus are, are stuck together and, and are in fact um, ejected in that way. We'll come to the dispersal later on. Um, so there's uh, another ascobolus and uh, a third species. Um, so these can um, often be um, at least partly identified by size, uh, colour, uh, and then by looking at the spores, they they, ask about, uh, they, they have fairly distinctive spores, um, often with with grooves and ridges, uh, which under the microscope enable um, um, identification to take uh, place. So. Um, Although it doesn't reflect their classification, it's quite a useful distinction to look at to um, see whether your, uh, uh, um, your, your discomycete has uh, hairs, perhaps more correctly thin spines um, or not. So a few um, species with, uh, with hairs. Um, these are, I think, always particularly attractive. 
and um, Kylimenia stercorea. This has been, um, this was, um, you know, this, uh, And um, a few without hairs, there's even a, a pesiza which occurs rather infrequently in my experience. Um, this is hair dung um, and uh, pesiza phimetii um, does occur on hair and rabbit dung. Um, usually if you've completely forgotten about the dung and left it for a very long time. Um, Another chylomenia, um, originally coprobia, but now in chylomenia. So this is a chylomenia without, without hairs. Th this is particularly common on um, cow dung um, and uh, can be um, uh, really very attractive. And um, a, a very widespread and common species, uh, particularly on, on rabbit dung, um, iodophanus. Um, this pinkish orange um, cup fungus, which is slightly hairy uh, at first, uh, but then um, loses its uh, its web and uh, looks as it does in that picture. Okay, so um, perhaps the majority of the um, ascomycetes that you might find on dung are perithecial. Uh, these are often very small indeed, um, and uh, they are, some of them are embedded in the dung with just the, um, the uh, sort of snout protruding above, uh, others are sitting on the top. Um, there's two or three genera of, of, um, of perithecial ascomycetes um, that have lots and lots of species, Schizothecium, um, Podospora, uh, Sporomiella, um, there's uh, one with uh, um, hairs um, and one of the perhaps strange to, to most of us features of some of these dung pyrenomycetes are that their ASCII contain not eight um, but either fewer or more spores. Um, a few have four spores, eight, 16, 32, 64, all the way up to at least 512 if you're prepared to count them. Um, and those large numbers, um, because they're only found in a few species, are great identification features. Um, identification, I, I think it's fair to say, of these um, perithecial species is, is, is more tricky. Um, need to look at the spores, of course, um, and they are typically surrounded by a gelatinous sheath. Uh, which is extended to form appendages. And it's quite difficult to see this sheath um, under, um, if, if mounted in normal mountains under a light microscope. It's just so transparent. Um, one of the tricks is to add a very small amount of India ink, um, the suspension of particles to the mountains so that the, um, the appendage the gelatinous sheath and appendage um, can be seen clear, surrounded by uh, the slightly turbid um, India ink suspension. Um, not quite as easy as it sounds, but it's, uh, it, it does help. There are hundreds of species of these. Um, one very easy to identify um, um, perithecial ascomycete is Peronia, the nail fungus. Um, here the, the perithecia are embedded in a, a soft stroma um, and form this, look a little bit like um, a disc of my seat, but the, um, they're called nail fungi because the, um, the, 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 um, the, there's a stalk rather like a, a crude nail which goes in, or has of course come out of the dung. So this is a species which has attracted a lot of attention. Um, it's said that it was quite widespread, um, and perhaps common, uh, when horses were, were used um, in the first part of the 20th, up to and including the first part of the 20th century. Um, but then with the uh, loss of um, horses for agricultural activities um, during and soon after the or soon after the Second World War, uh, this species became very rarely seen. Um, it persisted um, in the New Forest on the New Forest ponies, 
And in the last 20 years, it's become uh, really quite widespread on the Danga ponies used for conservation work on um, nature reserves in southern England and in uh, at least four places in Norfolk for heaths. Um, it, it's really quite, quite common. Um, there is a second species of peronia, which is not common. Um, I haven't a photograph of it here, but it's, um, it, it's a little bit smaller um, and fewer uh, perithesia, and it occurs on rabbit dung. It's called peronia erisi, and um, there's, I say it occurs on rabbit dung, the, the one um, location for it in North Norfolk, it's on rabbit dung, uh, but it has since been found in Suffolk on pony dung. So you can't be absolutely sure that if you're looking at a peronia on pony dung, that it is in fact punctata. Uh, and if you're able, you should look at the spores because although the erisi um, are smaller um, in diameter, the, the fungus is smaller, the spores are actually larger. So something to look out for there because I expect that's more widespread uh, than we think. Now, um, as um, folk will know, many ascomycetes have um, a quite separate asexual form, the anamorph, um, which produces uh, by an asexual process uh, canidia. And peronia has um, an anamorph as well, which is not often described, um, although I come across it quite frequently. Um, it's somewhat similar to the, um, the teleomorph, the sexual form. Um, but it has a much longer stalk and the flat top is powdery with conidia. Um, um, there are other um, anamorphs on, on dung, um, um, many of which would be really quite difficult to identify, but not, not, not a huge number of them. One very uh, prominent one is a penicillium, penicillium vulpinum, where the, um, the uh, hyphae uh, cluster together to produce um, a, a quite a, um, an obvious structure. Um, and uh, with this blue green um, uh, canid at the top, the same sort of color as the penicillium um, mold on oranges. Um, so, and that's much more common on, on bird dung. It does occur on uh, mammal dung, on the rabbit pellets, and it does occur sometimes on rotting fruit. So this is one that is not necessarily um, always on dung. Um, that's another little anamorph um, on, uh, on dung. And there are um, pseudothesial ascomycetes, um, clystothesial or, or gymnothesial uh, ascomycetes. Most of these, um, the ones that occur on dung, also occur on other substrates such as bird pellets and sometimes bones. Um, and I have very little experience of these, but we came across um, this Gymnoasca species, uh, bright orange, um, on, on cat dung. Right, so um, the zygomycetes or the, or the true moulds um, also occur on dung. Um, and in fact, after a few days, a fresh dung specimen will almost invariably be covered with um, a furry growth of uh, one or other of the two common Pylera species. And that's a, a horse, um, a, 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 a pony dung apple uh, that's well covered with, uh, with Pylera. This can be a bit of a nuisance because it can mask um, the fungi that uh, are going to develop later that you may be even more interested in. And, and getting the, um, the Pylera off can be, can be tricky. Um, uh, sellotape can help, just lightly applied and pulling off the, the strands. Um, but one way of avoiding this, this problem is not to collect very fresh dung, because once it's dried in the field, although it will produce a great variety of, of, um, of fungi for your delight, it, uh, it won't usually produce um, much in the way of, of this pile there. Pylobolus, um, this is a, a beautiful little fungus with some very interesting dispersal um, abilities, which I come to um, at the end of the talk. Um, it's just a millimetre or two high, extremely common, um, and it has this um, 
glassy sort of flask. I don't know whether you can see it at the, bl the black background, but uh, at the uh, end of that, at the nose, as it were, there's a spore mass and, and that is ejected. Um, and we'll come to that later. But really beautiful under the stereo microscope is Pylobolus. Two uh, widespread species and several that are, uh, are not very often recorded. And um, one more that may come to uh, your attention, and this is really um, an ammonia fungus rather than a dung fungus, Phycomyces, which um, is uh, several centimeters long and forms a great carpet of, um, of sporangia. And uh, this commonly occurs um, on um, under bird tables where um, seed has been dropped and then the birds have defecated and, and so there's a high nitrogen content, uh, and then you get a mass of phycomyces. Right, well, that's just a brief introduction to a few of the forms. Um, so um, let's talk about um, how you can study these, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, the first thing you've got to do is find the dung. Um, Rabbit, hare, deer, sheep, cow, horse are all good sources of, of dung. Sheep maybe have fewer, um, uh, sorry, sorry, cows um, and, and horse, rather fewer species perhaps. Um, and herbivorous um, birds uh, like uh, pheasants and, and grouse um, also, and, and, and ducks and swans uh, will uh, have, um, um, uh, dung produce uh, dung which will produce um, uh, some fungi but generally a, a smaller uh, variety. Um, other um, dung of, of, of rodents is I think generally um, it's so small and it dries out very quickly and doesn't seem to produce um, many dung uh, fungus species. Um, whether you collect the dung dry or moist doesn't seem to matter. I've already suggested that collecting it really fresh um, invites um, an overgrowth of pilera mould. Um, you might think that it could be too dry, um, but my experience is that it really quite dry rabbit pellets or dried horse dung will still produce um, a good variety of, of fungi. Um, But one of the big problems is if the um, the dung has got uh, has picked up sand grains, you'll spend um, a lot of time um, examining the um, the pellets or pieces of dung and, and not being quite sure whether you're looking at an interesting fungus or a sand grain and trying to pick the sand grains off. Um, you may have no choice, uh, but but try not to get dung that's um, obviously got covered with sand. Um, so um, incubation, well, it sounds rather grand, but it's, uh, it's, it's just a matter of keeping the fungus in a moist atmosphere, keeping the dung in a moist atmosphere. Uh, and that can be done in any sort of enclosed container. Uh, the ones you'll use probably reflect your eating habits uh, because anything will do as long as it's got a, a top, um, which can then be pierced to allow some gas exchange. Um, but it has to be transparent because um, most fungi, probably all uh, of these fungi, need light to develop properly. Um, there doesn't have to be bright light, uh, but they need light of, 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 of some sort. So um, the dung pieces or pellets can be placed on a, a wet paper towel. I find that just taking an ordinary sheet of kitchen towel, fo folding it uh, into three one way and then three the other way uh, to make a pad about uh, six centimeters by uh, five or six centimeters by five or six. Um, and then to wet it with um, enough water to make it re really wet, but not to have free water sloshing around. Um, and I often measure it out as about 15 cubic centimeters. Seems about right to wet that amount of towel. Then the dung pellets are placed on that. And um, don't be tempted, as I have been in the past, to soak the pellets. Uh, before you do this. The problem is that if the pellets have a film of water over the surface, it's, um, it may well inhibit um, fungal fruiting body development, but it also makes it very difficult to see them. So um, just wait for the 
dry um, uh, dung to absorb water from the pad of, of paper that it's on. Um, if you're only interested in the Ascomycetes, which are all quite small, then it doesn't matter how deep the container is. If you want to um, see and, and look at um, the agarics, then you might need a bit of headroom, um, especially if they grow uh, long and lanky because the light isn't uh, bright enough for them. Um, and one um, way around this is to put the, the pad with the dung on um, a lid, some sort of uh, base at the bottom of a taller container. If you um, uh, just put them at the bottom of the tall container, then you'll find that when you look at them under the stereo microscope, um, you can't you can't get the nose of the microscope uh, close enough without uh, bumping into the container. So um, one way around that is to put them on a, a lid and then lift the lid out uh, to examine them. Um, yeah, pests can be a problem. I mentioned the uh, overgrowth of, of mold species. Um, I find that horse dung is the is the one where the pests are most of the problem. Are these likely to be the larvae of um, of dung beetles and dung flies, um, and um, they can they can eat the dung um, almost before your very eyes. Uh, mites can be a problem as well, um, and um, if 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 it is a problem, then um, you could if you wanted to spray with insecticide. Uh, which, as far as I know, wouldn't harm the fungi, but uh, would kill the, the insects. Um, it's, it, I don't find it a, a large problem. It, sometimes um, nematode worms will uh, develop in large numbers. Um, I don't think they cause a problem, but it's just a bit of a surprise when you see them waving around under the microscope. Um, so um, then you have really need obviously need some sort of magnification and the stereo microscope, the knock in the microscope is, is absolutely ideal. Um, you can use a hand lens, um, but it's just not quite so convenient. When you would like to examine them in detail and possibly attempt identification, then the easy way is to, to remove the, the fungus, the fruiting body onto a slide using a needle and um, generally in, into water as, as, as the main mountain. Um, it is sometimes useful to have other mountains and stains, but most of the work can be done uh, simply under water in the usual way. Um, examine for up to 12 weeks um, and possibly more. Um, depends really on, on your patients, I think, and, and how many other activities have, it, have intervened in your life. Um, but ideally, you would want to look um, perhaps uh, once a week at your, your dung to get the um, number of species. And you, you, you could well get five to ten species on a, a dung sample, not necessarily on the same pellet, but um, on dung that you collected at the same time. Uh, right, identification. Um, the saw, the source that I found very, very useful is um, that by Mike Richardson and Roy Watling, originally um, produced in uh, the mid 1960s, but revised in, I think, 1996. I don't think it's in print now, but the good news is that it's available as a PDF on, online. And um, all you have to do is search for keys to fungi on dung. And on the first page, you'll almost certainly find um, um, the PDF, uh, which you can uh, download. Um, the species in, um, it uh, doesn't include any anamorphs, but it does include quite a lot of the zygomycetes. Um, undoubtedly, um, there will, uh, will be many name changes, um, but they can usually be traced through. Um, another very useful source, um, unfortunately out of print also, is um, one of those by uh, Martin and Pamela Ellis, Microfungi and Miscellaneous Substrates. There's a, a large chapter on dung fungi. This is largely um, overlaps with uh, Mike Richardson's book, um, but it does include rather uh, some of the anamorphs. It, it isn't so good on the zygomycetes. Um, and um, the other book which you may come across is um, a, an enormous um, volume um, in Italian, 
by um, De Vere, um, which looks to be in, um, very comprehensive. Um, and in a way it is, um, but it's a little bit misleading because although many species are described, they're only the ones that the author himself has actually found and studied. Um, and the Italian um, uh, Copophilus fungus flora um, is, is largely the same as ours. There is some, there's a considerable overlap. There are uh, keys and um, some descriptions in English, but the majority of the book is in Italian. Um, so those are uh, the three main sources, and I think that in, in that order. Right, just um, for the last um, 10 minutes or so, um, a word or two about um, how dung fungi work, uh, a little bit about their ecology. Um, I'm certainly not an expert, but I'll pass on one or two of the uh, things that I've uh, found interesting. Um, I think one's first thought um, is that there must be a great deal of host specificity. Are the fungi found on rabbit uh, on rabbit dung the same as those found on pony dung? Well, the answer is there's a huge overlap. Um, there are many species which are commoner on one sort of herbivore dung than the other, but the majority of species seem to be uh, able to occur on a very wide variety of dung. Um, so um, a, a big overlap. Um, uh, another aspect is succession. Um, fungi, um, the, the, the first ones to appear are, are the mold uh, zygotes, uh, zygomycetes, um, and then typically uh, some of the ascomycetes. And then after a couple of weeks, um, the coprinoids start appearing and then they continue um, maybe more than one species from one pellet um, for um, for weeks as do the ascomycetes um, uh, so that after the initial two weeks then there is no, there is not a, such a clear um, succession now whether that succession is uh, that, that does exist is due to um, one fung a true succession so that one fungus modifies its uh, its environment uh, or uses up a particular nutrient um, before the other I don't know but I think what is more likely is that some are just more slow growing than others and um, therefore um, they, they just take longer to develop and feed and then fruit um, but these are all things that can be easily studied um, um, one of the um, uh, aspects that is, is widely commented on is that dung collected in the winter months, so sort of October, November through to April, um, will have more species, not massively more, but significantly more species than dung collected during the summer months. Whether this is quite what, what this is due to, I, I don't know, but I suspect that um, there's an adaptation so that in the summer where in, in, in these latitudes, the dung is more likely to dry out, um, probably does reduce the development and fruiting. Um, and maybe the, these fungi are less able to, um, to um, develop at, at higher temperatures. So they're fruiting is pushed into the cooler and therefore wetter months. Um, um, dispersal is, is, is interesting. I rather presume that the agarics disperse in the usual um, basidiomyce way of dropping the spores, using very large numbers of spores, dropping them, um, having air currents uh, disperse them and then um, because there are so many spores, um, a few will land on a suitable substrate. I may be wrong. I don't think that um, uh, Basidium isete uh, spores um, need to pass through the digestive tract of the mammal, uh, but they might do. Um, but certainly the Ascomycete spores almost certainly do where, where it's been uh, um, investigated. They pass through the gut of the animal, which of course means they they get to the right place uh, very precisely and also affects their, their dispersal because um, they need to get their spores away from the dung 
because animals will have behavioral traits which prevent them um, grazing around their own dung for the danger. The danger is that, of course, that they'll pick up um, parasites. Um, but but it, it's less important, if I can put it that way, for the fungi to disperse great distances because the, the mammal is going to be doing some of the dispersal for them. As long as they can get clear of the, the spores and get clear of the dung, picked up by the mammal, um, it will have walked around and probably gone quite a distance before it uh, voids them in its dung. So for that reason, um, pre I presume for that reason, many of the um, coprophilus fungi have particularly large uh, and therefore heavy spores. Uh, th th this means that their uh, momentum um, is is greater, so less easily um, um, opposed by um, wind resistance. And because the Ascomyces are spore shooters, they shoot their spores up and away from the dung, uh, maybe only a, a, a centimetre or so. Um, and many of them have um, sticky sheaths, so they stick onto vegetation, uh, and that means they're more likely to be ingested by uh, the grazing mammal. Um, so um, heavy spores are useful. If you've tried to throw um, something into a waste paper basket on the other side of the room, um, if it's a tennis ball and your aim is good, you'll probably get it in the waste paper basket. Um, if it's a screwed up piece of A4 paper, uh, you might. Um, if it's a a tissue that you've screwed up, you probably won't. It'll only go a short distance. Um, so that's the same sort of thinking for the, the spores. So um, the um, one of the Ascobolus species, Ascobolus immersus, um, has um, sort of, uh, ellipsoid spores, which are between 50 and 70 micrometers long, which those of you who have looked at spores know that's pretty big. Um, and 25 to 35 micrometers across. So a pretty massive projectile. Um, the Sacobolus um, uh, fungi, um, all the spores, eight spores in Ascus, stick together and are ejected en masse. So that increases the mass, of course. Um, and it's now uh, thought that, it, in fact, in other species, Ascobolus, again, um, the spores, although they separate under the microscope when you're looking at them, they do stick together uh, with their gelatinous sheath uh, and, uh, and are ejected again en masse. But um, to finish up with um, and go back to uh, pylobolus um, on, on the dung, um, th this has the uh, ability to shoot its spore mass further than any other fungus. This diagram helps so that um, when the spore mass is uh, ready to be discharged, maybe there's several hundred spores, uh, so this is a, a relatively heavy structure here, the pressure increases in this subsporangial vesicle, um, presumably, well, I'm sure by osmosis, and um, th this membrane uh, ruptures and fires off the spore mass um, and, and it's been measured to, uh, to, to, to go um, two meters. So well clear of the dung and any vegetation around the dung. Um, it's always said that this, this means that it's more, like, uh, more likely to be ingested by animals avoiding their own dung. And therefore, as I mentioned, parasites. But just to say that there is one, um, at least one parasite, the larvae of, of lung flukes are climb up inside, up the stalk of the pylobolus into the um, subsporangial vesicle and get ejected with the spore mass. Um, 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 and so that they, they can complete their life cycle. Um, if anyone is um, experimentally um, inclined, uh, pylobolus is so common on horse dung, rabbit dung and so on, it's very easy to collect. Um, and you can have some interesting investigations with this ability to fire its spores. If you um, enclose the, um, the dung with a pylobolus with um, a laboratory beaker or a, um, um, a jam jar um, and cover the jam jar with um, dark paper, but leave just a slit a millimetre or two wide, 
cover the top as well. So completely dark except for one slit where the light can get in. Then leave the um, the dung with the pylobulus uh, overnight in a not brightly but in an illuminated place, and come back the next day or a day or two later. Take off the paper, and you should find a black streak where the sporangia have uh, been fired and stuck onto the glass. Um, and you can actually um, measure the um, the accuracy by seeing how far, how much wider that streak is than the slit in the paper and it's no it's not significantly wider at all so the pylobolus is able to aim extremely precisely and it does this by bending the um the stalk towards the light before it fires one more thing you can do um especially if you um, are working with students and want to pose a a research question um what um color light what wavelength of light do they respond to so you can set this whole thing up in exactly the same way, but this time cover it with um, a filter, um, coloured cellophane, uh, blue, red, green, yellow, um, and see uh, whether the pylobolus can still aim accurately. Um, I won't tell you the answer, but there's only one of those colours that it can see and therefore aim accurately at. Um, if you cover it with any of the other colours, then it thinks it's in the dark, as it were, and uh, the spores go all over the place. Um, so with that, I will stop and uh, see whether any questions have arrived. Um, sorry, just get myself off mute there. Hello. So thank you very much, Tony. That um, I, I've heard some of that talk before at the group leaders meeting last year, but it was great to hear it again. And, and as before, I was struck by the quality of your images. It's it's fantastic to see such lovely photographs of some of these. Well, things. they're not all mine. I acknowledge the ones that weren't. No, no but uh, lo Thank lovely to see them. Um, so we've got we've got some um, comments and, and questions in in the chat. Um, just to start picking some of them out, there are a, a range of questions that broadly under the heading of the of ecology of the fungi. So. Um, uh, a comment from from Jasper Sharp about Coprinopsis pseudonivia, um, a, a species which I gather um, is fairly recently recorded in in the UK, um, and he asking um, um, well very interesting question about how do how do species actually move around geographically and how do these species um, get in get into the UK from elsewhere? So any any thoughts on that, Tony? None whatsoever, um, <laughs> except that I. Can... <laughs> I would like to answer, ask that question of somebody more informed than myself. Um, I can, can we speculate? Um, is it? It's always the same problem. Is it? Is it really a new species? Um, um, yes, co co coprinoids have been looked at. Um, quite common, but how, and also um, in some cases, the species has been separated from from another. That's that's. So it appears to be new to Britain, but really it's been separated by somebody else and it's been here all the time. I'm sorry, I, I just don't know. Um, I mean, with plants, we always assume that um, they're carried um, by human activity, um, nurseries and so on, to, to introduce uh, fung fungal pathogens. Uh, but not, not, with herbivor um, not with rabbits, I would have thought. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I don't know the answer to this. I mean, there are some great mysteries as to how some of some fungi, some bryophytes, some higher plants get distributed over huge distances. Um, not something that's not really um, very well and, known. I think. Just just to add that with uh, a caprina species, the spores are relatively small. I mean, um, and um, I, I don't know, some studies will have been done on how far spores can travel, but it can be significant distances. So yeah. I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if, if uh, they, what I don't know, uh, I don't know if the questioner knows, is where uh, uh, Coprinopsis pseudonivia um, has occurred in the past or is perhaps abundant. Uh, where has it come from, in other words? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, it, you, we, we must be aware making assumptions just because something was first recorded in another country and then has been recorded in the UK doesn't necessarily mean it's travelled from one to the other. Um, it could just Absolutely be it hasn't not. been noticed before. Absolutely. And and yeah. you never really know whether it's not gone the other way. I mean, we, we, we've exactly. acquired it, but maybe it started here and went there. Yeah. Um, 
Moving on, another, uh, another question um, from Roy Stewart. I'm asking if, if you know anything about the effect of ivermectins on, on gum fungi. No, I don't, but I, 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 I should have tried to find out. Um, I, I, th this is um, a, a worming treatment, which has certainly reduced the number of insects that uh, feed on dung, um, seriously reduced uh, them. Um, I'd, I'd be kind of surprised if it had an effect because it's so uh, insects and, and fungi are, are very different. Um, what I should have said and now have an opportunity to do so is that the number of fungi that you find on a dung sample depends very much on what the animal has been eating. And um, for example, if you um, incubate horse dung and the horse has been in a rich pasture, and possibly fed um, um, concentrates and things, it will have hardly any fungal species. But if you pick it up, the dung up from um, wild fed ponies on the on the local heath, then it will be hooching with them. Um, and I think that's rather more important, uh, possibly, um, th than, the, than the chemical treatment. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, and an in, interesting observation from Mike Richardson in response to that earlier question, um, pointing out that um, high level air currents may well play a role in, in long range dispersal of fungi, uh, as I suspect they do in, in things like bryophytes as well, moving moving spores around. The, so. the, the, the only problem there, I wouldn't disagree with Mike, of course, is that um, mm. uh, they're more prone to ultraviolet radiation, which um, kills spores right. really quite effectively so mm. that they can only be up there for a limited time. It might be interesting that the, the brown spore species might survive longer. They may have some protection against UV uh, mm. than the pale spore species. Yeah, interesting. That, yes. Um, as ever, uh, one question just leads to more and more questions, doesn't it? We know so we little it. about That's many of these things. It. Indeed it is. Um, uh, moving on also still on the sort of ecological um, area. Um, Alan Clark was asking whether there are any actual measurements of, of nitrogen or ammonia levels or, or, or well, are we actually making just assumptions about um, about this? Yeah, there are, because I'm not an academic mycologist, um, I'm, I'm, I, I do occasionally come across papers but someone like Mike Richardson has has has, has yeah. published that sort of thing. Um, so yeah. the answer is yes, but I can't give you chapter and verse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, a very interesting observation I thought from Alan about the different behaviours of um, different uh, sexes of, of horse and, uh, you know, his, his male having different um, behaviour to males and geldings. And, and that, too, may have an effect on the, the distribution of, of some of these species. So much to study. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and another area ripe for investigation, I should think. <laughs> um, so um, um, if, if I could come in, just one another question on ecology for me. I mean, you you presumably, from what you're saying, Tony, have, have collected and studied your fungi mainly in, in Norfolk. Mm. Um, are, are you aware of any geographical differences in um, in the distribution of, of dung fungi? Any any species that are particularly frequent in Norfolk as opposed to other parts of the UK? Well, they're simply not studied enough to, um, to, to, to do that. And I think even someone like Mike Richardson, who's collected and studied for, for many years in many places, um, including around the world in his case, um, and from, I don't have the details in front of me, but I think species that he's collected um, in um, South America and other distant parts, there's, there's a good deal of overlap in, in, in the species uh, found there. Um, for example, the, I, I mentioned this little um, peronia on rabbit dung, um, not, doesn't seem to be widely recorded anywhere, um, a few places across Europe, um, but in Australia it occurs on wallaby dung. Um, <laughs> we you know, presume it's the same species, but one never knows. Mm. Well, there are wallabies um, living wild in various parts of the UK. So, well, I, I haven't for. actually looked at wild wallaby dung, but I did get some from a local um, zoo, and uh, there was nothing what I would call interesting. There was very little because, of course, they're not wild fed. Um, yeah, yeah, you'd have to go to uh, mm. to Australia, I think, to get the real yeah. thing. Yeah. Um. So, a few other observations in in the comment. Um, uh, interesting observations on succession in fungi 
um, in dung fungi, um, possibly based on the fact that different fungi use different nutrients as the dung matures, um, which certainly makes se sense to me. Um, comment from Alan Clark about um, insecticides, saying that the, in his opinion they've reduced the number of, of species, but not the numbers of insects per se. Um, which is was interesting. So, whether that has any effect on the the fungi? So, just just, no. just just to make clear that that's the number. That's an insect statement. Yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, not 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 related to fungi. No. Sorry. No, okay. Fine. Yep. That's, yeah. Um. Right. Any final questions from anyone before we we call a halt to this? Okay. Well, if we could just end, I would like to just pick up on, on one of your first comments, Tony, which was about the fact you haven't looked at, at, at um, uh, fungi on, on um, dog dung, oh, yes. um, which, was, which was a challenge laid down, as you pointed out, by Dennis um, many years ago. Uh, and it's quite interesting to, to look at the actual quote from Dennis's book, which I looked out before this. Uh, before your talk, and, and just to read out the relevant sentence, he says, a rich harvest may well await the man, doesn't mention women, no. who cares to devote his leisure hours or his declining years to the study of stale dog dung. <laughs> so there you go, those of us who, who may be said to be in our declining years, perhaps should take up the challenge there. <laughs> but um, I look forward maybe, to the talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Right. Um, I, I, um, there is just um, perhaps one final question I, I uh, slipped in at the end there, but I will raise before we draw a halt to things. And that um, has anyone used environmental DNA? Are you aware, Tony, to um, investigate which species present in dung? No, I'm not aware of of, of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, that would be interesting to know yeah. because that mm. may well reveal species. Yeah you wouldn't yeah. notice because they're not <laughs> again one thing i didn't mention which is perhaps slightly relevant is that the uh, i don't know and it may be difficult to find out what sort of competition there is within um let's say a rabbit pellet because several species um, many species will occur fruit on that pellet but of course the edna could tell us how many more species are in the pellet and not fruiting um yeah. and 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 possibly hint at uh, competition between um, between species. Yeah. It, some species excluding others, as it were, yep. it's a yep. possibility, but I know nothing. Hmm. Well, I, I think I will um, let, let people go after that. Um, thank you, Tony, that went I mean, a very stimulating talk, um, really interesting. Um, Thank you very much. I'm sure I speak for everyone in saying that uh, that's made a very worthwhile hour and a half. So thank you. Well, thank you, Marcus. Yes, and thank you to everyone for um, attending.